Need the singing. <laughs> That's good. Okay, 186. Are you able, said the master, 186. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. 186. All right. I'll take my glasses off. I was hoping Nancy would be there when it made her time. <laughs>
slight change yes. and I'll send a or Bill will send it out um, a notice don't, uh, don't come to the chapel come to our old classroom on Sunday, on Sunday. On Sunday. Yeah. On Sunday. no Saturday no Sunday no, we're coming on Sunday pardon? we're coming on Sunday there will be no yeah. Saturday yeah no Saturday, yeah. No Saturday. This is the coming last one. on Sunday two changes oh my goodness we will send a reminder. <laughs> um, I am so sorry I missed everything here at church this week, uh, but I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, our April lineup for teachers, Bob will be teaching today, Elaine will be here on the second Sunday, Susan will be here on Sunday the 17th. I hope I have those dates right. They might, those dates might be Saturdays. <laughs> you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new trick. Um, anyway, the first, the first Sunday, Saturday is Bob. <laughs> the first Sunday is Elaine. The second Sunday is Susan. And then we have our mixed bouquet without a Sunday school. Um, Susan is going to cover both of those lessons on uh, the third Sunday. We'll remind everybody. Um, I did I, last week. I talked about a human interest story in the newspaper. I just love the story, and I'll pass it around. If you want to take it home and read it, please feel free to do so. But it is very heartwarming. This man is a true Christian. What? He got arrested. I'm sorry. He got arrested. It's in today's paper. Is it in today's paper again? He got arrested. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, what? Um, I didn't get the whole article read, but it was something about 
trespassing. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> it was a nice article, but they ruined it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <clears throat> okay, Bob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a nice story. Sorry. Yeah. I know. Oh, dear. The end of the story is he's in St. John's County Jail. Oh dear, oh dear, all right. I won't pass the story around. <laughs> well, it was nice. <clears throat> Bob? Oh, Bill, our devotion. I'm sorry, I've got a terrific headache. I can't think. <laughs> yes. Is there any other news, prayer requests? I think Betty got off with her daughter. Um, Oh, for the party, make sure that they bring a dessert or a yeah. Uh, side yeah, it's it's in the invitation. Okay, good. Well, it's going to be unusual coming Sundays again, which is what we're supposed to do. But when they close the church. We persevered. We were already recording because we had members that weren't coming. And then Pat stepped up and we were did the first lessons on our porch. <laughs> then we invited people to bring their chairs and they came. And then our music department brought music. <laughs> so we really, it's been a great year because we have persevered, and the Sunday school has kept going, Amen. which is what it's supposed to do. So, I said what and I no said. And no one had COVID. Huh? And none of us had COVID. Right. right. Well, if they had the flu or anything else, it would have been probably called COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We haven't had some of Pat's neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we it, it it was a wonderful exper Christian experience, really. Yes. Mm -hmm. We 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 yeah. did when they closed the church. We did what most people did, and we've prospered and grown, and we've had the faithful have shown up. All right. According to Jim and Jamie Ducher, filmmakers known for their knowledge of wolves. When happy wolves wag their tails and romp about, but after the death of a pack member, they grieve for weeks. They visit the place where the pack member died, showing grief by their drooping tails and mournful howls. Grief is a powerful emotion we've all experienced, particularly at the death of a loved one or treasured hope. Mary Magdalene experienced it. She traveled with and helped support Jesus and his disciples, but his cruel death on the cross separated them. The only thing left for Mary to do for Jesus was to finish anointing his body for burial, a task the Sabbath had interrupted. But imagine how Mary felt when she found not a lifeless, broken body but a living Savior. Though she hasn't at first recognized the man standing before her, <clears throat> when he spoke her name, she knew he, he was. Jesus, instantly, grief turned to joy. Mary now had that joyful news to share. I have seen the Lord. Jesus entered our dark world to bring freedom and life. His resurrection celebrates that he accomplished what he set out to do. We too can celebrate his resurrection and share the good news. He's alive. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we celebrate your resurrection and the new life we can experience in you. Amen. Bob? Uh, good morning. It is a nice morning. For those of us who like a little bit of chill in the air, it is a great morning. 
breathing is, is good. As uh, Bill mentioned, it's been a great year, it's been a unique year, and this is a unique time. I have never remembered presenting any kind of a message on Saturday, okay? Saturday before Christmas, uh, before Easter, before Christmas, before Easter. So I'm gonna, I've asked Esther to help me out and do something. She's gonna read something, a brief reading that'll help us start off on this very unique day. I'll start out by saying this was written by my sister Netta from Atlanta, Georgia in March 1986. He was only 33. Without even thinking, every January, I seemed to sign up for the devotions in spring. A year or so ago, I wrote about looking forward to spring and how I thought we'd enjoy nature, our neighbors, and how happy we were to see one another and be over with winter. Well, tonight I would like to tell you about how much this time of year means to me in connection with my Christian feelings, and I hope you share some of these feelings. For as long as I can remember, I have looked forward to Lent, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then the greatest of all, Easter Sunday. It started when I was young. I was told the story of a baby that was born in an unusual way and only walked this earth for a brief time and died at the age of 33. This young man was a carpenter. He was a teacher. He was gentle, he was kind, and his life would be over at the age of 33. This man took on 12 to help him tell the story of love, of faith, of trust, and to proclaim his word to the strong and the ill. He healed the sick. He made the blind to see. He raised the dead. And he revealed the promise for you and for me. And his life would be over at the age of 33. Now his time was running short, for there were men in high places that feared him. The crowd, some were for him, and others were against him. And before he knew it, he was sentenced. Little did they know that it was in God's plan to sacrifice his only son for the goodness of man. He carried the cross up Golgotha's hill and hung on the tree, suffered for you and for me. And he was only a young man of 33. The crowd spit on him and refused <coughs> him a drink. And they mocked him and laughed at him but not once did he anger think. But to his heavenly father he looked and said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He suffered, he bled, and he gave up the ghost. And to a tomb he was carried, where he would stay, it was thought by most. But on that beautiful Easter morning, new life where every Christian was born. As we enter his house on Easter day and sing Christ the Lord is risen today, up from the grave he arose is our cheer, and to our eye may come a tear, and in our hearts we all shall be free because of the life and the suffering of this young man of 33. She's the talented one. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. You see, if you looked at your lesson, and I know some of you do and some of you don't, but if you looked at your lesson, you'd find it's Isaiah 52, well, 52, 53, but the text for today was 53 verses 4 through 11a, I think is the way it's put. And it's a description of what happened to this man, this gentle man, this nice man of 33, what was done to him, and it's interesting because what was done to him was not done, the correction, it was done by the Romans who didn't love him, but it was only done by them because the religious leaders didn't want to get their hands dirty. They were the ones who brought him to his fate. They were the ones who were responsible for the hair pulled out of his face, the 
a crown of thorns jammed into his head, but blood all over him. And I don't know if any of you remember The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson. I can only ever see that once. People told me how many times I saw it. I couldn't see that very often. I still see it. It's, he, what happened to our Lord was horrible, but it's a, what's even more horrible to us, I guess, is it, that's really what would have happened to us. And I, the reason we're I've talked about the text, but that's probably all we'll do with that lesson, by the way. Because the text, for instance, the background text we heard yesterday, if those of you who came to uh, Good Friday service, you heard Isaiah, the, back, the whole background from 52 to 54, 53. And that, by the way, was a very good service, well done. I've uh, been to lots of love, it's different than any that I've, I've seen before, it was new to me, but it was very well done, and those of you who missed it, missed it. I'm sorry about that. But when I thought about preparing for this lesson, and I looked at what the lesson was, and I realized that that's all that has to do with Easter, is this description of Isaiah. Now, it's interesting because he wrote that description over 700 years before Christ was born. And he did detailed it. You want to read the details, you go to the Gospels and you get exactly the same detail. And that's about the most interesting thing I find for there. And Cokesbury, to their, let's face it, to their um, credit, if you will, it's a six-year period and they have lessons and sometimes they fall on days that Easter changes and it's not much of an Easter message. And to me, this Saturday... And the Easter message for this Saturday is what we used to do on Good Saturday, if you would want to call it that. And I grew up in a, in a small town where from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, we missed one day in church as a Lutheran. Excuse me, two days, Saturday and one work, work day. And in that same small town was a little congregational church where Esther went. And on Good Friday, we had a three-hour service where each word of the cross was given a, its own time frame. If uh, you got a windy preacher, he spoke for too long. If you got a, a guy who stuck to the message, he spoke from 12 to 15 minutes max. And in between, it was all kind of um, religious music was done. But it was a time of quiet and respect. And that bled over onto... When you left there at 3 o'clock, so the shops that had been closed were now open, but when you had your dealings, they were done quietly. It was all a sense of quiet. And then it bled over into Saturday, where Saturday became a day of meditation. And that's one of the reasons I asked Esther to read that, because if you read March, that was, I didn't go back and check in the calendar, I'm sure, but that was done during the meditation period for that Easter. And that's what I'd like to talk about now, today. Jesus Christ, we ask, why, why did he come? He left his heavenly home and he came here. Why? Why would he do that? Well, I ask people on that in Sunday school classes, and many times I hear, well, he came to learn about us, to learn how hard we have it here on this earth, how hard it is to live and be good Christians, how hard it is to follow the law. And I know that makes us feel good, but the truth is that's not why he came at all. He came because he already knew what we were. Yeah. Poet once said what Christ saw from the cross, he saw every sin that had ever been and all that ever would be. And he saw the center of every sin. So I know that he saw you right there next to me. And where did he see us? In a great big sea of sinners. And he saw that from the cross. And it's the same vision he saw from heaven. So he came. Did he come in spite of that vision? Uh-uh. He came because of the vision. He came because he loved us. He was the greatest teacher in the world. He taught us, I'm going to tell you two messages quick. One, he taught us love. That's why he endured all of this from his friends. His friends did all of the damage to his body. His friends. Okay? I often wonder how many of those religious leaders that called for his death were there when he was preaching 
teaching at age 12 in the temple. And certainly that wasn't the last time he taught, right? So love was the message here, and love for us. But there's another message that has been bothering for last, me for the last couple of weeks, and it's the forgiveness that this exhibits, right? He's teaching us to forgive, and he's teaching us about eternity, right? We all want to go there, right? Our Revelations group, we talk about eternity all the time. <coughs> Pardon me. We talk about eternity and the rapture. We all like that thought, but it's a time of judgment, and there's going to be all kinds of judgment. There's good judgment and bad judgment, and we have a choice we, of that. You and I have a choice as to which we get. And the way to forgiveness is interesting, and you forgive me. Silas will kill you one way or another. They're yeah. doing their best. But forgiveness is interesting because as Christ forgives us all of our sins, makes us clean enough to go into heaven forever. Forever. And not only us, but every human being who's ever lived from the time of Adam till the time when he comes again will have had an opportunity to hear the message from Christ. We have no excuse. We've, we've heard it, had, it, had it available to us from the time we were born, most of us. But there were some people who died before Christ came. And when I look at Saturday, that very first Saturday be, between Good Friday and Easter, you know, that was the Sabbath. That's a day of rest. And you think after it, that time on the cross that Christ would have been resting, right? <laughs> he was working. You, you know, you, you said it, you, you used to say it. Even Methodist creeds used to say that he descended into hell. If you look at your Methodist book, and I did, you look at the creeds in the back of it, you'll find that there's been a, I call it a uh, regression. It's gone from, he used to say that he died and went to hell. Then he said, well, he died and went to the dead. And now we say he was dead and buried. Okay? There's a big difference. Because what was he doing in hell? He was teaching and preaching. Okay? Why would he do that? Because those people before that had no opportunity. And he knows the end game. The end game is believers have a judgment, non-believers have a judgment, and nations have a judgment, by the way. <laughs> All three of those. We study, we'll be studying those in the upcoming weeks in our class. But everyone was going to be treated with the same opportunity, and the only way he could do that, he went and he preached the gospel down there. Same gospel he preaches up here. All right? And one of the things that I started to say, it bothered me. We have to, in order to be forgiven, we have to forgive. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, he tells us that forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you read Mark, Mark 11, chapter 11, the 25th and 26th verses, you'll find that here, these are the words of Christ again. They're in red in your Bible if you've got one of those Bibles. And it says, if you're standing there ready to pray, and you have something against your neighbor, or he against you, go settle it. Because you can't ask, Jesus, ask God to forgive you unless you've forgiven so I've used this time as meditation and an individual this week, a loving individual, or several weeks ago, I should say, told me they had a hard time forgiving. And I realized that, you know, I, I've never hated anybody. I've had some people cause me some very strong pains, some wounds, but I've never really hated anybody. I've hated things that they've done. I hate things they've done to me, done to the church, done to my family. But never hated anyone. But then I forgive them. And I thought that this last year I've done a lot of forgiving that I hadn't been able to do before. And I thought I did a lot of forgiving. But I started thinking it over. There's a little bit. You never get a wound. And you know how it heals? It gets a scab. 
and that scab's going to fall off by its own, and then you'll be healed. The skin underneath will be fine. But sometimes, some people have a habit, and they'll pick at that. You know anybody's ever done that? Okay. You pick at it. Well, some of us, that's the way it is with our forgiveness. See, I, I forgave the people for what things they gave did to me a long time ago. But I couldn't forgive them for what they did to my family or my church or my friends and now my nation. I couldn't do that. But magnanimously, I could forgive them for what they did to me. But you know, forgiveness is its all in or nothing. We've got to forgive. That little bit, we have to stop scratching that little bit. That little wound, that we, as we scratch it, we know it's there. We know it's healing, and more we scratch it. And that's the way it is with forgiveness, too. We like to keep that little bit, well, I can forgive what they did to me, but I can't forgive what they did to you. Or you. Okay? The point is, you've got to. And it was never your business to have to forgive them for that anyway. But many of us carry that in our backs. It keeps us from being forgiven ourselves. And it keeps us from living the life that Jesus came to do. He came to give us life and have it more abundantly. And abundance is joy. And since I've forgiven those things that I had no business, no need to forgive of other people, it wasn't my job. If there's judgment to be done, God's going to do it in the end. And there again, it wasn't my job. And I finally feel joy. Because I don't have that load anymore. And I do know that the person I was talking to is not present with us now. But I hope they get this message. But it is good. To be forgiven, you got to forgive. It's really that simple. And so easy. All you got to do, Christ has already forgiven it. He's already forgiven you for not forgiving it. And he's reaching out with that offer of forgiveness for you. And he's reaching out to take that stuff that, you don't, that you're holding on to. Just lay it in his hands. He'll take it back to the cross. He took care of that 2,000 years ago. And you've been carrying this dead issue in your mind. And some of us, I hope, I hope I'm the only person in the room who ever had that problem. But I think I know better. Okay? So stop scratching that scab. Stop, you know how it is if you ever had poison ivy? You want to get rid of that poison ivy? Stop scratching it. You know better. You're not supposed to do that. So anyway, that's my message. Use today as a better time for meditation for yourselves. Maybe you have something to teach us about that your meditations. He gave you a gift today. He gave me a gift today. The first time that we ever had to really think about Good Friday. It's always been a day of rest for me or a day of calm and quiet. Not anymore. It's a day of joy. And I think today's joy. How about tomorrow? Let's close. Prayer. Almighty God, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your gift of forgiveness, for your gift of love, and for the gift of joy. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bill, you get a ray of sunshine for us? Yes, I do. <laughs> Stephen has a religious heart. Remember, Sunday at 10 o'clock in our original room. <clears throat> a Baptist preacher was seated next to a cowboy on a flight to Texas. After the plane took off, the cowboy asked for a whiskey and soda, which was brought to him and placed before him. The flight attendant then asked the preacher if he would like a similar drink. Appalled, the preacher replied, I'd rather be tied up and taken advantage of by women of ill repute than to let liquor touch my lips. The cowboy then handed his drink back to the attendant and said, Me too. I didn't we knew, know we had that choice. <laughs> if we'll all stand, we'll be dismissed. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord.
my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Every Sunday at 11 o'clock.